Well, good morning, everyone. If you would please find your seats. We will get started. I always hate to break up the fellowship in the church because it's just what we do, right? You guys are nice and quiet. So I am obviously not Pastor Dave. Uh, stop that. <laughs> I'm like this, I'm like this. Uh, so uh, as most of you know, Dave is sick, both Dave and Trish. So um, myself and uh, the other elders uh, took up Bible study, men's breakfast, and here I am doing the message for Sunday. So uh, thank you. Uh, not <laughs> we found out, I think, Tuesday night, and with the way uh, my schedule uh, was this week, I really had two days to uh, put a sermon together So, with the slides and everything. So uh, not to my own horn, but um, the Lord is good, and... Um, yeah, I, so we'll see. <laughs> any any failures are all mine. Anything good out of it is all the Lord. So, um, Carl and Randy always said, "Well, Carl uh, said, you know, we should always have a sermon in our back pocket." And I I was not prepared. So, <laughs> next time this happens, I will have something uh, tucked in my back pocket. But I've titled today's message, "How Great Is Our God," and because he is great. And we're going to go through the first chapter of Ephesians. We're going to try to. Um, I'm going to try not to have a three-hour long sermon, because each verse could be a sermon in and of itself. But um, the theme is Ephesians 1-7. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace. So uh, we'll pray. And then we'll jump right in. Lord, I thank you for every soul here and for the time that you've given us this morning to hopefully, Lord, see more of you that we might pour into your word. I pray for your help, Lord, that you would teach through me, that your spirit would be in each and every one of us, that you would till the soils of our hearts to be able to receive your word and to see Christ, and to be more like him. I pray for our pastor, Lord, and his wife, Trish, that you would heal them, Lord, and bring them back to us soon. And Lord, I lift up all the needs of our body. Father, you know. You know. So, Lord, help me and help us to see Christ in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So part of the reason for going through Ephesians 1, I personally love the doxology passages, which is a big fancy word. Um, but essentially, they're, you find them a lot in Paul's writings. You find them at the end of Jude, um, Colossians, where we get away from this earthly realm for a little while and we're catapulted in one sense or another into the throne room, into heaven, and we get to see Christ and the Lord in all his splendor. And Ephesians, the entire book is wonderful, but um, Ephesians chapter one really puts us there. So... Ephesians 1, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, 
with which he has blessed us in the beloved. So just a very quick intro. Um, the Apostle Paul, who wrote, I think, about 75% of the New Testament, um, the human author, anyway, uh, he's the author of this letter. And he's writing to Christian believers in Ephesus. Um, there's some dispute whether or not it was a circular letter, meaning it just simply went to other churches. But um, the main audience is the church in Ephesus which was the capital of the Roman province of Asia Minor, and it's located, or is located in modern-day Turkey. And if you read in the book of Acts, Paul had an extensive ministry in the city, and it's documented. Um, he spent about two years uh, there, so this is probably when he's writing this about five years later. Um, he opens in verse, in verse 2 with the phrase, grace and peace. That's very common in Paul's letters. You see it all over the place in the New Testament. And it's using the Greek word charis for or grace, which is God's kindness that he shows to us. And um, actually the Hebrew word uh, shalom, which is peace. So he's wishing God's grace and kindness and peace to those who are in Christ. The theme of the book overall is creation reconciled and the church ultimately united in Christ. I realize the wire is over here. Okay. So he goes on, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. So this word blessing, or to bless, means to give thanks and ultimately, we give thanks to God because he has blessed us in Christ. Amen. The Greek word actually for blessing is eulog eulogia, which if you write it out, it looks more like the word eulogy. And we know eulogies. We typically have them at funerals. Um, they're the praise for the deceased, but they can also be used for giving thanks. And in a sense, when... We're giving a eulogy. We're giving thanks for the recently deceased, right? Yet he says that we are blessed. So how are we blessed? How are we blessed in Christ? Well, it says we're given every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. It also says that we're chosen, we're adopted, we're made holy and blameless. He says we're blessed in Christ, in our Lord Jesus Christ, and that phrase is actually mentioned 27 times in the entire book of Ephesians. Now, something to keep in mind, he's writing here to believers. That's the main audience. I am never going to assume that any congregation in any church is 100% full of those who worship Christ and know him truly. So I just want to put out a disclaimer that if you don't have a saving relationship with him, one, you should. But two, any of the promises and the blessings that we're going to cover this morning do not apply to you. So search your heart and come to him because he's worthy. So the phrase in Christ is mentioned 27 times in the entire book of Ephesians, and it's mentioned numerous times. I didn't count in this first chapter alone, but we see that God is the source. He's the source of all our heavenly blessings in Christ, in the Father, and he's given us every spiritual blessing. And it's his plan and purpose to bless us in Christ. So the question is why? Well, it says, it says here, and numerous times in this passage, it's for the praise of his glory. And again, this purpose is repeated numerous times through this book. Now, when we get to verse 5, my wife, <laughs> my wife was like, Johnny, don't, don't park the car here. Because <laughs> she knows me well. So I'm not. I'm going to just let a little pressure out of the can, or I'm going to try to, Okay. <laughs> You guys know. <laughs> Verse 5, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. So, 
<laughs> the doctrine of predestination. Yeah, here we, here we go, here we go. Oh, fun. Okay, I'm going to end it right here, watch. Psalm 115, verse 3. Our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. <laughs> no, we're not going to leave it there. <laughs> we see this in the Old Testament. We see the Lord's choosing of his own people. Deuteronomy 7, 6 through 8 says, For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. Why? The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. It was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on and chose you. For you were the fewest of all people. They were the smallest. But it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers. That the Lord has brought you out of a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. We are chosen as a treasured possession in Christ because of the Lord's love and of him keeping his word. It's obviously not us because we let the Lord down every day. First commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And not one of us has done that for a fraction of a second in its entirety. But in Christ, it has been done. Likewise, in 1 Peter chapter 1, 17 through 21, he says, And if you call on him as father, who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He, meaning Christ, was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Christ is at the center of our salvation, of all of our blessings, of our entire lives. And if he's not, he should be. But we see both in the Old and New Testament that we have been chosen. It's not something that you can just, you know, you don't have to like it. There's plenty of stuff in the scriptures that makes me bristle or, you know, people have plenty of problems with, and we're not going to solve this debate this morning. But I just want to see it's something that has to be dealt with. In Titus 1, verses 1 through 3, Paul goes on to say, he's a servant of God, an apostle of Christ Jesus, for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness, meaning from their knowledge of the truth comes right living. In hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began, and at the proper time manifested in his word through the preaching which Paul was entrusted to. God's elect, and if you don't like the word elect, change it with believers, it's the same thing. We come to godliness through faith in the gospel truth of Jesus Christ, which has been promised to us before time began by God the Father. We're going to see that our salvation from start to finish is Trinitarian. And it's amazing in the fact that it is Trinitarian because each member of the Godhead, the Father, Son, and Spirit, have a role to play in saving us. The Lord predestined us. He chose us from before we ever did a single thing, before we were even born or thought. And he set us apart. Likewise, in 2 Timothy, verses 1, 8 through 10, Paul says, therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me as prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the age began, 
and which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And praise God for that. When we think of this doctrine of God's choosing, we really have to balance it out and search our hearts as to why, if it does bother us, why does it bother us? And it bothers a lot of people and a lot of sincere believers. Yet, we have no problem with our own choices. We make choices every day. We choose what we're going to eat. We choose what kind of car we want to drive. We, we choose our spouse, most of us. I know I did. <laughs> in, in America, we do, anyway. So why do we have no problem with, with our choices and our ourselves making choices, but when it comes to God and his choosing, it's a problem. Common answer is, oh, it's not fair. Well, if you really want to play that game, in fairness, in God's fairness, everybody from the get-go is instantly guilty and instantly goes to hell. There's no guarantee, there's no owing of anything to any person. The fact that he sent his son to save us at all. He made a way when he didn't have to make any way. Shows his love for us. And really, the most unfair thing to ever happen in all of history was the son of God living a perfect life yet being nailed to a cross for it. For people who don't deserve it. Yet that's the summation of the gospel. And really, if you think about it, every one of us, practically speaking, believes this doctrine. And I'll prove it to you. Because when you pray for your lost family and friends, you're not praying that really they'd change their heart or save themselves. You're praying that God would. Amen. So I'll just leave that there. <laughs> With that stone in your shoe. So we see, <laughs> we see the Father in his grace setting a people apart for himself in eternity past before any choices were ever made outside of his own. So the question leads to, how does the son participate in that? If we go into the next verses, we'll see. In him, we have redemption through his blood, meaning Christ, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and on earth. Ephesians 2.4 it says, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace, you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God himself prepared beforehand, that we should walk in them. Apart from Christ and him saving us, we're dead in our sins, the scriptures say. It's not debatable, it's just a fact. Yet in spite of that and our guilt before him, God sought us out and he saved us in Christ and he seated us with him in glory. And why? Because of his kindness. It's not because of anything that we did or anything that we will ever do. He didn't look down a tunnel of time and see all the good things that we're going to do. If anything, he prepared anything good that we will ever do for us to walk in beforehand. So literally nothing in our walk we can take credit for. 
even our faith is a gift from the Lord. So we can take credit for no good thing that we've done outside of the sin that required our salvation. Notice that it says that he gives according to the riches of his grace. It's according to, not just out of. So this isn't like a billionaire giving a few dollars out of his funds. This is according to, meaning what we're given is based on the whole of his riches. He lavishly pours out all of it on us. We see the love of the Father and the Son and the Spirit, right? And we get to participate in that love because we are in Christ. The Father's love towards the Son is what we get to experience with. And yet he still loves us individually, and that's an amazing, amazing thing. says he lavished his riches on us, meaning he gave the abundance of. And do we see, by him pouring out the riches of his grace and giving us all wisdom and insight, that he wants us to understand his will for us? And ultimately, when we understand Christ, we understand the will of God. He wants us to walk with him. He wants us to be like him. He made us in his image. So if we understand Christ, we understand God's will. And we see the beauty of God's plan from eternity to eternity being centered in Christ. Christ is the fulfillment of God's plan to reconcile to himself fallen humanity. And not just fallen humanity, but all of creation. We're going to be ultimately in a new heaven and a new earth. And this fallen earth will pass away. And it will be made new. Even better than the initial creation. We see a glimpse of this at the end of uh, earth towards the end of Revelation, Revelation chapter 21, verses one through five. He says, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every fear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. I don't think we grasp the fullness of that. That we are going to be in a new heaven and new earth, free from sin, free from death, free from all pain and mourning. All we know is pain and mourning in this life. We know joy, we know happiness but it's tainted. Yet we'll be free from sin in the new heaven and new earth and glory. And all of creation will be free from sin. Even stars die. Everything is tainted by sin. The entire universe has been tainted by the fall, yet it's going to be perfected. And it's all done through Christ and his work. And that's an amazing thing. So moving on. Verses 11 through 14. In him, we have it obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him, you also, when you heard the word of truth, 
the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. So we looked at the Father and his setting apart a chosen people, and we looked at the Son and his work on the cross. Yet we know from Scripture that Jesus sends the Holy Spirit to those who believe in him. So what does the Spirit do for us in our salvation and our redemption? Well, it says we've obtained an inheritance. And again, we've been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. So it's not what we think, it's about what God thinks. It's his plan, he can do what he wants. And aren't you glad? It says we have an inheritance. So we have both attained an inheritance, yet the wording can read that we are an inheritance. And that's also true in Scripture. Jesus says that a people has been given to him by the Father, his flock. And we can think of ourselves as obtaining an inheritance, right? An inheritance is not something that any one of us can earn. It's something that's given. You can't demand an inheritance. It's just not going to happen. Yet we have obtained an inheritance. Yet how often do we really feel like we've walked into that? Because I know I don't. And that's, that's part of why we're looking at the scripture. I'd like us to just scrape the surface of what we have in Christ and the riches that we have in Christ. So we've obtained an inheritance, and we are an inheritance. And it makes sense when we think about God giving us an inheritance. That's great, because God is God. He is perfect. He is holy. He is wonderful. And it makes sense out of his kindness for us to get an inheritance because he says so, right? But then the flip side is more difficult, us being an inheritance for Jesus. Because I live with myself, and you all live with yourselves, and we know all the dirt in our closets. We know the things we struggle with, the thoughts we have, the words that fly out of our mouth when somebody cuts us off on the parkway, all that fun stuff that's not glorifying to him. And yet, we're an inheritance for the son. But again, the question is why? How does that work? Again, think of the plan of God. He purposed for himself a people for his son, for himself, to be holy and blameless. God didn't save us that he would leave us the way that he found us. He brought us to himself to make us holy and blameless. And we're not going to be perfect this side of eternity, but when we get to see him, when we get to glory, it says we will be known. We will know him when we see him. I don't understand how that's going to work, but I know that when we see him, we will be as he is, holy, blameless, and perfected. And that's the goal. My sinful fallen brain, this side of eternity, can't wrap my head about having a sinless, or having no, no sin, sinful thoughts in my head. I can kind of figure out, like, not walking in actions and doing sinful things, but to have the mind of Christ to be totally sinless in my thoughts is a much more difficult thing, and yet Jesus did that for us. It's an amazing thing. So we have an inheritance, yet we are an inheritance. And we've been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to his will. So that we who were the first to believe, hope in Christ, or sorry, so that we who were the first to believe in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. So we see, according to the counsel of his will, our, our lives fall directly into God's plan. His purpose is for us to know and love him through Christ and yet also to be known and loved by him in Christ. 
And again, we don't deserve that. Yet that's the beauty of it. And it shows the depth of the Lord's heart towards us. In spite of ourselves. So Paul says, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ. Paul's a, a, a Jew. And he's been preaching to Gentiles. His ministry, oddly enough, was given to Gentiles and not the Jewish people. Yet the Jews, we see, were the first to hope in Christ. They were the first called. They were the first set apart in the Old Testament. Yet Paul's writing to Gentiles who are now allowed into fellowship with God as well. We saw that when Christ was crucified just a couple weeks ago when the temple veil was torn from top to bottom, meaning everyone was allowed in to the Holy of Holies and to the presence of God now. It wasn't just limited to a set of one, one type of person. And we see that right here looking around in our own congregation. We have a mixed bag as the church of those who are Jew and Gentile. I think we're mostly Gentile here, but we do have, we do have uh, some ethnic Jews as well. I don't know. I'm not a Jew. I'm a Gentile. Yet that's the beauty of the church. Because it doesn't matter where you came from. It matters that you're under Christ. Paul says elsewhere that that retaining wall has been broken. There is no Jew, nor Greek, nor slave, nor free. Yet all in all are in Christ. And that's the plan from the beginning. You see inklings of it throughout the Old Testament where Gentiles are saved. And the Jews even had a process to allow Gentiles in. They had a court of the Gentiles in the temple that they might worship, but only so far. Yet now the fullness of being allowed to worship has been opened up. So we see our inheritance, right, with the Spirit, the work of the Trinity. How does that happen? Well, it says, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation and believed in him. So we hear the word. Faith comes by hearing and hearing through the word of God. I didn't come to saving faith the first time I heard the gospel. It had to be repeated over and over and over and over again. And then all of a sudden, bing, it clicked. And it wasn't because I woke up one day and it's oh, that makes sense. I'm going to believe that now. <laughs> it was God, because I can't explain it. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 5, Peter says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. So to answer the question about the Spirit's role, He grants us an inheritance and He seals it. So our inheritance is guaranteed because God is keeping us through faith by the power of the Spirit. Do you see that? It's imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. Meaning, it doesn't get less. It doesn't degrade over time. It's just as good as when he first declared it to us. And it's being guarded, not by what we do, because we drop the ball. We do drop the ball. Yet it's being kept in heaven for us. And we by God's power, being guarded through faith. It's all of God. Is that clicking? Because I'm trying to explain it. Because I'm trying to make it click in my own head. Because I live in such a way sometimes that betrays that I don't always believe that. Our tendency is to try and earn it through basing it on some sort of work, on baptism, on communion, on even us making a proclamation. But it says we love him because he first loved us. 
he set his affections on us and changed our hearts and drew us to himself. I can't explain how that all works on the timeline to make it palatable, but I know what the scriptures say. And that's the beauty of our God. Because we know we don't deserve it. We know that we don't deserve it. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, or second, yeah, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, sorry, verse 21 through 22 says, And it is God who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us, and who has also put his seal on us and given us his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. The Holy Spirit has locked us in in our hearts. There's an inward testimony, right? I mentioned earlier that if we're in Christ, we're going to walk a certain way. And that's true. And why is that? Exactly because of this verse. Because the Spirit has set His seal on us. He's locked us in. He has become our down payment, our guarantee. And if we do have the Spirit, we're going to live differently than when He initially found us. It's progress, not perfection. Don't be so hard on yourself that like you wake up one day, you, you know, you have this desire to kick the dog, you're screaming at your neighbor, you know, you're yelling at your wife, whatever. Like you have bad days. It's okay. It's progress, not perfection. The Lord knows. Amen. He, he knew from the beginning. Okay. So don't be so hard on yourself. Cause I know we have a tendency to do that. I know at least I do. Romans eight. Notice I'm staying in Paul a lot. He's, he's a good cross-reference for himself. Romans 8, 22 through 25 says, For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes in what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. How many of you groan inwardly? Yeah, me too. And I'm what some of you would call young. I'm 34 going on 80. That's how I feel. (laughs) Yet we fall apart. And we groan because we're uncomfortable. And we have to ask why we're uncomfortable. And I think the Lord lets us be, in some measure, uncomfortable in this life to keep us ready for the next and to look forward to it. Yeah, it's difficult. It's difficult to deal with the trials and the hardships of life. But all creation groans. Even the earth. Yet we know it's going to be completed. It's going to be redeemed. Along with ourselves. So the question would be, are you comfortable in this life? Because I know sometimes I'm a little too comfortable. And it causes me to forget the Lord. Yet our groaning causes us to worry. Trials and anxieties come. Cause us to doubt God's goodness. Yet Paul tells us to hope. And the word hope that Paul uses, he's not using the term like we do. We use it more like wishful thinking. And that's not the case. Paul never uses the word hope in that type of that type of way. He speaks of hope as a determined fact of looking forward to something that has been finished and declared. It's as good as done. And in Luke 12, prior to what I have up here, Jesus tells us not to worry. He says, don't be anxious for what you eat, what you will drink, what you will wear. For your Lord knows 
And he says, fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. It's the kindness of God that he gives us himself and everything in him, including his kingdom. Jesus says that we have nothing to fear or to worry about ultimately because we are inheriting his kingdom. And the Father gives it to us out of his good pleasure. You see how good our God is? We don't deserve any of this. He would have been totally just once the fall happened to just let Adam and Eve procreate and go forward in their sin, never have another word with them. Yet he didn't do that. And that was the plan. Because Christ was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. 15 through 23. Paul says, For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love towards all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. And the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe, according to the work of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places." far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all and in all. As I was working on this, I really wanted to split this in half, but Paul writes in the Greek with literally no apostrophe, no punctuation at all. So I'm like really racking my brain like, Lord, how do I split this in half? And eventually it's like, you can't. So here we are, 15 through 23. (laughs) So we're going to tackle it as a whole. For this reason, because Paul has heard of the faith of the saints in Ephesus and their faith in the Lord Jesus and their love towards each other, He gives thanks for them, remembering them in their prayers, or in his prayers. And likewise, as an elder, I can say that about all of you. The thing that's kept me here for the last 12 years of my life has been the love of Christ displayed to myself and to everyone else that's been in in here, in this congregation. We are a very loving church because we love the Lord. And I love that. (laughs) So Paul has heard of the faith and love of the Ephesians. And likewise, we see it demonstrated in us. We love our Lord. Hence, we love each other because we're in him. And it causes him to give thanks for them and to pray for them. So what does he pray for? He prays for them to have the spirit of wisdom and of revelation and a knowledge of him that they would have the eyes of their hearts enlightened and that they may know the hope to which God has called them and the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints and what is his immeasurable greatness of his power towards them who believe according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ. So he prays that they may have revelation and knowledge of Christ and the Holy Spirit. This is a prayer of enlightenment for believers that they would understand the things in the scriptures. And we understand the scriptures ultimately only because the the spirit is at work in us. It's one of the evidences. We understand the scriptures by the power of the spirit who gives us wisdom because the spirit is the ultimate teacher. We have a lot of people, a lot of churches even, who deny that the word is inspired They attack the sufficiency of the scriptures and they cause good believers who love the Lord to doubt him. 
We're talking about predestination. We're talking about the work of God and how he keeps us. He keeps us in spite of ourselves, right? God is sovereign, meaning he is above everything, absolutely everything. So it kind of baffles me when I hear these people challenging the word of God. Like, I love to read personally. I really love to read. I don't have a lot of time to do it anymore, but I love to read. And I love the scriptures. And when I understood that the scriptures are not just one book, but 66 books written by 40 different authors over 1,500 years in numerous, in I think three different languages over the span of three different continents, you can't have one human author keep that, that type of thread going in all of his work. They're going to mess up. So what do we have? A, a spreadsheet like in the desert? Like, oh, keep this in line and keep this in line. It's like, no. It, it's the sovereign power of God that in his providence that keeps the word together. Amen. It's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. And we should never doubt the sufficiency of his word. It's trustworthy. Not because you had, you know, the a bunch of foundations and crews of people together keeping it in line, but because God's in that and he's powerful enough to, for us to keep his word, or for him to keep his word together so that we might know him according to his ultimate plan. It's not hard when you think about it. We just get all twisted up by what fallen, stupid, sinful men say. Trust God, not man. And in accordance with God's sovereignty and power and keeping his word, we see even more so the working of his great might. In verse 20, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated it at his right hand in the heavenly places. We see here Christ's power in his death, his resurrection, and his ascension. Paul's praying that we would understand that we have the same power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him on the throne. That same active power is at work in us because we are in Christ. It's not because we're like super strong or anything. It's because of Christ working in us and through us. He grants us that same power. I don't feel that, do you? <laughs> Yet it's true. It's at work. And he goes on to say, Christ is far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. <coughs> and he put all things under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. We as the body of Christ, as the church, are the fullness of Jesus. We are an outworking of what he has done. And yet he is far above all earthly and spiritual authority. He is the ultimate authority. I love the passage in Colossians where it says he is before all things and all things hold together in him. Amen. He holds the universe together by the word of his power. So why do we doubt that he's not going to be concerned with us as well? He keeps the stars moving. He keeps the earth rotating. He causes day and night. It's nothing for him. And yet we think that he's going to just abandon us and not tend to our needs when we need him most. It's a lie. Yet we believe it. But he's far above all earthly rule and authority. And every knee will bow. Philippians 2, 9 through 11 says so. Therefore God has highly exalted him, Jesus, and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, 
and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Every knee, every single one, will bow. That includes Satan. That includes the fallen angels. If they won't bend willingly, he's going to break their knees. And even these two. I'm a politics junkie, so I had to throw it in. But I'm going to leave it there. Because it could get ugly, and I don't want that. <laughs> no earthly kingdom. And even at the end of all things, both of them will bow the knee. All of us will. Psalm 139. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance, and in your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. We're talking about predestination. We're talking about the role that the Lord has in saving us. And it's not a detached choosing that the Lord sets forth to set us apart and to redeem him or to redeem us for himself. He is actively aware of who we are going to be, of every action that we will ever do all the good and the bad. He's, he's not unaware. David writes this psalm, and I've heard it before. We, we see it with pro-life, you know, the pro-life movement, you know, uses it all the time and plenty of churches do, and that's all well and good. Um, but do we consider it? because we never want any scripture to become just like a trite, repeated thing that we hear. And um, I want you to think back to where the Lord found you when he first saved you. Do you remember where you were? Amen. Do you remember the season? I can't recall to you myself the day that I gave the Lord, I couldn't put it on a calendar for you, but I knew there was a moment when it made sense to me, the gospel, and I knew I was a sinner and I needed salvation. I gave my heart to him. Whatever it was worth, or is worth. Yet think farther back than that. Think of the day you were born. At the risk of being self-indulgent, I'm going to use myself as an example. Most of you who know me well know that I was uh, preemie. I was born three months premature, March 21st, 1990. Supposed to be born sometime in June. Yet I came out early, and at that time, my lungs needed to continue being developed. And uh, my dad and my mom, they had to actually sign um, like a, a waiver for experimental medication for lung development that's used actually widespread today. Again, the Lord and his providence. Yet, this was me about a month after I was born. I was hooked up to tubes. I don't remember that, obviously, but... I, was, I had to make up those three months in an incubator while well, my lungs developed and while well, that medication worked. And that's the love of God providing doctors and medications 
to go forward with that and to use that on me because the Lord knew. The Lord knew the day I would be born. He knew the resources that would be needed to keep me. And he knew, even now, as I stand here before you, how that would look and how that would all play out. And I didn't appreciate any of that until I came to know Christ and see that he had his hand on me way, way back then and even beforehand. My mom's not here, but when I send this to her, she's going to kill me for this. <coughs> this is her holding me, and I was, I was tiny, tiny, tiny. I was a little Benjamin Button baby. That was me. That was me. But that's me. Yet my question is, where were you? Think back across your whole life and think of what the Lord has gotten you through. That was my start. Yet I'm going to end in glory Amen. along with everyone here who's in Christ because I didn't keep myself. The Lord did. Amen. That's why he's good. I don't have it up here, but 1 Corinthians 1, 26 through 31 says, For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful how many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, Righteousness and sanctification and redemption. So that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boasts in the Lord. Christ is our righteousness. He is our sanctification. And he is our redemption. All the credit and all the glory goes to Jesus Christ. Do we remember or realize where we came from and how God has had his hand on us? Most days I don't. Yet when we take that time to look back, we'll see it. From eternity past, God has had a plan. He's had a plan to make us ultimately as perfect as Jesus is. And in that purpose to glorify him in Christ and ultimately to spend eternity with him. <clears throat> Ephesians 1 is wonderful. And that's Ephesians chapter 1. Yet Ephesians 3 is just as equally wonderful. I don't want to share the prayer here. And we'll finish. Ephesians three fourteen through 21 says, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, length, height, and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Chapter 1 contains a prayer of enlightenment for us in Christ. If this prayer here in chapter 3 contains a prayer of empowerment. Think of what Christ has done for you. What the Father, Son, and Spirit together have saved you from. And rest in the glorious promises that await us as we walk forward towards Him in glory. I don't feel adequate to try and 
explain that passage because <laughs> it's just too deep. And I don't even feel adequate to use my own words really to pray. So I'll, I'll pray the sermon back. I'll pray the, uh, sorry, I'll pray the scripture back. Father, for this reason, we bow our knees before you, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of your glory, Lord, that you may grant us to be strengthened with power through your spirit in our inner beings, so that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith. Thank you, Lord, that you've rooted and grounded us in love in your love. Please strengthen us, Lord, and help us to comprehend together what is the breadth, length, height, and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. And help us to be filled, Lord, with all the fullness of you. Thank you that you are able, Lord, to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to to the power that you've worked within us by your spirit. And Lord, to you be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever.